Welcome to my 180th video on my work with OO Gauge. This part deals with obtaining and setting up a new controller for my Hornby 003 rail tabletop railway, a Gauge Master controller intended for panel use, but I made it into a handheld controller. I'll finish with some three rail running video using the new controller. A couple of things were in play here. On the one hand, I'd been interested for a while in trying a Gage Master controller, since so many people running British model railways seem to consider that Gage Master controllers are the best. On the other hand, I really wanted a handheld controller for my Hornby 003 rail tabletop railway, as it was difficult to shoot running video there when I had to reach down to a controller underneath the table to operate the trains. Now, I could, of course, have bought a Gage Master Combi, and I was indeed considering that. The Combi is designed to be a handheld controller. The Combi is designed to be powered by a separate 16 volt AC power supply, and is sold with a power supply for use in the UK. I'm in Canada, so that UK power supply would be no use to me, but I could easily enough find a separate source of 16 volt AC power. In fact, Gage Master also sell this, the Model W, which is basically just the combi without a power supply. So, if I were to buy directly from Gage Master, I could have saved myself £5 and also avoided getting a useless power supply by buying this model. But it would have still have cost me £45 plus shipping to Canada, so about $100 Canadian by the time I got it. There might be cheaper buying options for the Combi on eBay, for example, but I've never seen a Model W for sale other than directly from Gage Master. As it turned out, what I actually ended up buying was this, because it turned up locally with my regular supplier British Model Trains in Cambridge, Ontario, for 25 bucks. When I saw this listed on the British Model Trains website, I immediately bought it as a Gage Master controller for $25 seemed to be the best deal that I could expect to get. I'm not entirely sure what this is, it doesn't seem to have any model number on it. The closest thing that Gage Master sell currently is the Model 100, which is very similar, being a single track controller designed for panel use with OOHO or N-Gage layouts, and taking 16 volt AC input. The most obvious difference between the Model 100 and the one that I bought is that the Model 100 is much taller than it is wide, whereas the one that I bought has a square panel. The only other obvious difference is that the Model 100 has a red light, which lights up with variable brightness as power is applied to the track. Mine has no light. A subtler difference is that the Model 100 is specced specifically for 16 volt AC input, whereas mine says that the input can be anywhere between 10 and 18 volts AC. Here's the controller that I bought on the bench. It's a bit scuffed and has obviously been used, but it seemed to be in good shape. Nigel with British Model Trains tested it before putting it up for sale. Here you can see how the guts of the thing are attached to the front panel. Not an awful lot there, really. Here's the panel head-on. This works essentially just like Gage Master's current controllers, with a regulator dial clearly marked from off to 100% in 10% increments, and a direction switch that can be set to forward, reverse, or a central position for off. I almost wonder if someone hasn't cut this down at some point, as the positioning of the Gaze Master logo and the mounting hole seems a bit odd. I was going to need something to power the controller with 16 volts AC or so, preferably at something like 2 amps or at least 1.5. When I first bought the controller online, I was thinking of using a doorbell transformer, as that's the most readily available way of getting a 16 volt AC transformer in Canada. 24 volts is more common, but 16 volt transformers are generally carried as well. That would have worked fine, but those transformers come bare with no case or plug, so I would have had to have mounted the transformer somehow and added a plug. I mentioned this to Nigel when I went to pick up the Gage Master controller, and he said that he could probably find something that would work for me. He poked around, and the first thing that he came up with was a plug-in 16-volt transformer, but that was only rated at 1 amp. 
Then he thought of this. This is an MRC controller, actually primarily intended for G-scale trains, although it does also have a mode that allows it to be stepped down for use with OOHO. Mode 1 is for G-scale operation and mode 2 for HO, but more relevantly, it provides a 16 volt AC output. Here's a picture of the back without flash, rather flat, but it does show the details and connections more clearly. Nigel sold me this for $25, and I thought that it should work fine for power in the Gage Master controller. It's rather large, but that doesn't really matter as it can go out of the way under the table. There's the mode switch in the corner of the back panel. This controller is a slightly older model. The more recent version is the Train Power 6200, which seems to be much the same thing, except that the mode switch has been moved to the front panel. Here's my Gage Master controller seen from the back. Clearly, one pair of connectors are intended for AC input and one pair for controlled DC output. I could have figured out which was which. The diodes on the right of the board are kind of a giveaway. But there was a sticker on the back of the metal support giving details. There's still no model number, but it's designated as an OOHO controller with input 10 to 18 volts AC 20 VA, output 0 to 12 volts DC 1.5 amp. The latter didn't prove exactly true when I checked it with a meter, as we'll see in a bit. It's also circuit breaker protected, but I wouldn't want to rely on that too much. I bought this controller with the idea of somehow fixing it up so that I could hold it in my hand and operate it with one hand, since that was really what I wanted. So rather than mounting it to a panel, which it was really made for, I wanted to fit it into a handy box of some sort. I measured it to aid with determining what I might use as a box. The panel was three inches across. And three inches high. The panel is made of metal, aluminium, I think. The guts in back stuck out just over two inches to the ends of the connectors. I did consider just mounting the controller in the cardboard box that it came in, which might well have worked, but another possibility that suggested itself was the small container for potato salad seen at left here. I figured that I'd go ahead with trying the potato salad box. If it didn't work well, I could always try something else. I held the controller against the lid of the box and marked the limits of the guts that stuck out so that I could cut a hole for them. Then I drew lines from my marks and cut out the resulting rectangle with a craft knife. The plastic was soft and easy to cut. Then I screwed the controller panel to the lid using some of the shorter screws from the M2 self-tapping set that I bought for fixing down my three-rail track. Here's the lid seen from the bottom with the controller screwed in place. I drilled some holes in the box to help with making an opening for the wires to go through. I cut two lengths of two-strand wire and stripped and tinned the ends. Because I was using the same black two-strand wire for both input and output, I needed some way to make sure that I could tell the input and output wires apart without any room for error. So I painted both ends of one piece of wire with red paint. I determined that I would use this red painted wire for the AC input. I threaded the two pieces of two-strand wire through the hole that I had made in the plastic box. Then I fixed the ends of the wires into the screw connectors on the controller. The red wires into the input connectors and the plain black wires into the output connectors. When I put the lid back on the box and pulled through the wires, this made an arrangement that I thought I should be able to work with, even if it wasn't exactly ideal. I connected the AC input wires to the 16 volt AC output terminals of the Train Power 6000 controller. And I connected the DC output wires to the three rail curved power feed track. 
This was a pain to do, as those little connectors with tiny nuts are terrible to work with. The threaded pieces that the nuts go onto aren't fixed and turn, and there's no easy way to hold them, so tightening the nuts is very tricky. As it turned out, when I turned on the Gauge Master Controller and tried it, on the basic principle of Murphy's Law, the forward setting of the direction switch made the locos go backwards. I didn't want to leave things that way, so I needed to switch over the DC wires. Since it was such a pain working with the connectors on the three-rail power feed track, I switched over the wires connected to the controller itself instead. And you can see here where I was in the middle of doing that. I checked the output of the Gauge Master controller by connecting my multimeter to the track with crocodile clips. This was with no load on. The controller produced just over 12 volts at the 60% mark. At max power, the controller produced just over 15.5 volts. The box controller fitted into my hand not too badly, and I was able to operate the controls with my thumb, though it would have been simpler to control if it had been just via a dial turned one way for forwards and the other way for backwards, which is how the handheld controls on the Morley controller that I use with my regular Hornby layout work. The way this Gauge Master controller works does make it simpler to bring a loco to a full stop by just turning the dial down until it hits the bottom, but it's a bit awkward operating the direction switch with one hand. Nevertheless, I was able to use the Gauge Master controller held in my left hand to operate locos on the three-rail layout, which was what I wanted so that I would be able to operate a camera with my right hand. The Gauge Master controller, with the 16 volt AC input from the Train Power 6000, seemed to produce very much the same operational results as the H&M Duet that I'd been using for the three rail layout previously. My freest running loco, the Duchess of Buccleuch, would run fine at around 60%. Other locos needed more like full power to get them going, and about 80% once they warmed up a bit, as here with my original Duchess of Athol which is the balkiest runner of the three-rail locos that I have. Here you can see the wires coming from the boxed controller and the Train Power 6000 under the table. It's not the best arrangement, but it's definitely better than not having a handheld controller at all. And honestly, I struggle with the trailing wires on my Morley handheld controllers as well. So now I'll try to show you a bit of running video using the new controller. This will also be the first running video that I've shot since I screwed down my three rail track. Well, most of it. Okay, let me just see if I can try to show you some running video with my new controller and my newly screwed down track. Some of the tracks. Almost all screwed down on my apologize the board is still a mess partially because I haven't really finished screwing down the track there's the screws and uh, th This area this area here with the engine shed isn't screwed down because I'm planning to change it over to a Hornby engine shed in fact that there is the Hornby en engine shed extension kit <laughs> Which I bought after I bought the engine shed, but the extension kits arrived and the engine shed hasn't things are taking a long while to come from the UK and they're, well, they're very erratic. Some things don't take so long, but some things seem to take forever. Uh, so, anyway, so that's not screwed down, but we won't do anything with that for now. But everything else is screwed, everything else other than that. Even this, this good siding is screwed down. It's just the, the, these three sidings here are not screwed down. And actually, I'm planning to put, try to put another point in and put a fourth in, because the Hornby shed can take four tracks. Okay, so, oh, I haven't, <laughs> should have turned the power on before I turned the camera on, but whatever. So there's my master power switch there. Uh, power bar to power everything. Um, the uh, train power is 6000 is down there. Now I just left that, that has its own power switch, but I just left it switched on because, um, because, it, because I'm turning the power off on the power bar anyway when I'm not running things. Oh, excuse me, I'm still struggling with health issues a bit. Uh, okay, so, so we pick this up. It trails wires all over the place, but um, 
you know, it's not it's not really any worse than the Morley controllers that can uh, trail wire, so I'm going to have to set some points to run something. I'm going to put it back down again, because nothing, the points aren't set to run anything at the moment. We'll set that point straight, and we'll set that point straight, and that should give us a straight run to bring the Duchess of Baclou back from round from the back there. Oh, well, it would, except I've got this point set to turn as well, so that'll derail him when he hits it. A lot of points on this layout, and you've got to be careful, of course, to have them set right. So straight, 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 straight. So we should have a straight run round the outer loop now. So I've got this set to forwards, and... Oh, We'll turn up the power. A little awkward to do, but... And there we go. Right around 50%, the Duchess of Baclou starts moving. Because the Duchess of Baclou is a pretty free-running loco. We'll turn the power up to maybe 60%. And that'll be plenty for the Duchess of Baclou, and then maybe a bit faster than I want it, because I've turned it down. I've turned it down again to about just over 50. <sighs> now that, that's... I don't know whether you notice the difference in the noise that it's making now that it's uh, fastened down. It's uh, noisier, actually. You might have thought it'd be quieter, but it's not. I guess because it transmits the noise through the table better, so it's actually noisier now it's uh, fastened down. So, anyway, so he's so that's not even 50% now. Now he's warmed up a bit. That's 40-some 40, 40 percent. <sighs> yeah, I'm going to stop him again round the back. We'll stop him at the back. We'll turn the power all the way down. Had a devil of a time with that, uh, this little, <laughs> this silly little tunnel. It's very, it's not so bad for locos. Locos, pretty much all locos will go through it, no problem. But I had to be very precise about positioning it to get a coach to go through it. I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to get into trying to show you that now. That's a different issue. But yes, lo uh, coaches kept hitting, coaches kept hitting the tunnel and ripping the face off the tunnel and derailing the coach and whatever. It is possible to get a coach through, but you've got to be very careful. It would be, if it was on a straight, it would be easier, I guess, but I don't really have a straight I can usefully put it on. But to try and get coaches through it on the curve is tricky. Um, okay, so now, okay, we'll put the controller down a moment again and we'll change points again. So we'll change that point in a loop. That point in a loop. And we'll change the point for this this back siding because that's where the Duchess of Athol is. <sighs> so now I'm gonna have to now I've got to back the Duchess of Athol out. So I've got to change the power over to reverse, and the Duchess of Athol is going to need quite a lot more power. All right, oops, I'm standing on the wire. That's not good. I was trying to move this thing while standing on the wire. Well, it's humming, but it ain't moving. That's <laughs> well, see, the problem is it's not even moving at max power. Oh, well, it's barely moving, anyway. Gonna have to give it a poke, I think, to get it going. And that's max power. It just does not want to go when it's cold. And especially not in reverse. It's worse in reverse than forwards. Oh. He really does not want to go in reverse, and I've got to get him clear of that point. Okay. Whoops. Well, I changed him forwards, but I, I need to reset the point before I change him forwards. Okay. Uh, bit of bit of... Okay, so where are we? Oh, Little fiddly to do. Okay, so now we'll change him forwards. And that's also at full power. He will go. He just needs to get going a bit, you know. We, see, now I'm turning the power down a little bit. He just needs to free himself up a bit. That's still 95, but still, it's not quite full power, and he's actually moving, whereas I couldn't get him moving at all backwards, even with full power. Ah, dearie me. I 
is Alan Cummings used to say. Oh, I've derailed. Okay, we'll turn the power off and we'll figure out why we've derailed. Oh dear. Hmm. What has derailed? Hmm. Everything seems to have derailed. I don't know why. Everything seems to have derailed. I don't know the tender. Let's try and pull it clear here a bit. Is the tender on the rails now? Yeah, I think all the wheels are on the rails again. Let's try again. That's, uh, that off switch it on the controller is quite useful, just being able to flick it into the middle to go on off rather than having to turn the dial all the way down. Okay, so we'll go forwards again. And again, there I didn't turn the dial up. I just... Now I'm turning the dial down because he's going too fast. Fiddly business controlling these things. Now I'm down to 80% and he's going quite fast. See, once he warms up... I don't know. Maybe I should try blasting him through with contact cleaner again to see if I can clean more of the old grease and stuff off. And then re -lube him. I've done it once, but... See, because it's obvious that there's some sort of old grease and stuff gumming the things up. That's what it seems to be. So he doesn't want to, you know, get going when he's cold. But as soon as he warms up, so now I'm down to 75%. Whereas I could barely get him moving. See, about 75%. I could barely get him moving at full power when I started. Yeah, that's about, I just turned it down even a notch more. It's about 75%. <sighs> so, I mean, it sort of works, although I can, you know, if I have to get him, as you could see, when I had to get him started going backwards from cold. And then he's slowing down a bit again for some reason. I'm like, it's not me, I'm not slowing the power down. He's just randomly deciding to slow down a bit again. Um, yeah, trying to get him started backwards from cold, I had to actually give him a push. I just couldn't get him going. Uh, you know what? I'm going to try and take him through the reversing loop free, so I can put him into uh, oops, that side in going backwards. Uh, he's clear on that point there. I'll just pull him backwards a bit just to be sure. I'm going to try and take him through the reversing loop. So loop, 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 loop. Okay. This may or may not work, but we'll try. I'm going to try and take him through the reversing loop so he's going the other way because I want to back him into the siding. So next time I have to pull him out of the siding, I can pull him out forwards rather than backwards, which should be easier. Okay, so turn up the power. Round the reversing loop. And he managed to get through despite a little bit of sparking from the points there. Okay. So I'm going to... Well, I don't know. Wait a minute. What am I doing here? Uh, we'll close that end of the reversing loop. We'll reopen that siding. I'm going to try and put him into that siding backwards now. Oh dear. So... We'll set the controller to reverse, and I'm going to try and put him into the siding backwards. See, and now he's starting to move at 75% backwards, although I could hardly get him to move at 100% backwards before. Okay, and there he goes, he's in the siding. So at least next time we can pull him out of that siding forwards rather than backwards, which should be a little bit easier. So we'll close the point to that siding. Oh, let's try and bring the 8F now, out now. Power, well, actually, that doesn't switch power anyhow. It's a non-isolating point, but nevertheless, I'm going to try and drive through it so I want it in the right direction. So that is an isolating point. That will pass power up here and here, which is the 8F. Uh, so I need to bring the 8F out in reverse. See, now, he again, he's starting to move around 50%. He doesn't need as much power as the Duchess of Atoll. Okay, and we'll stop him there. Ah. 
and we'll move the point back so we can go round the inner loop. Yes, I'm just checking all the points to make sure the inner loop's clear. So we'll change this, this, uh, the controller back to forwards and we'll try and start him up. Yeah, he's starting to, well, it's, what do we get, 60%, 70 yeah, he seems to need, he's not very keen, is he? Go on. Hmm, now he doesn't seem to want to move so much, he seemed to be moving better before. <sighs> That's full power. He don't know, he would seem to be moving much better when I started. He'll warm up. They, they seem to wander these three rail locos a bit. He'll warm up. Still, we're still running about max power at the moment. Oh no, I, now I've gone down to... Yeah, see, I'm going down progressively as he accelerates. We're a little over 80 now. Well, see, now he's going too fast. So now we're 80. They really... They, I don't know. I don't know what it is with these three rail locos. Maybe just because they're old and they've got a lot of old grease on them or something. They really seem to need warming up to get going. Now I'm down to 70%, whereas I could barely move him at 100% when I started. Now I'm down to 65%. Oh. What can you do? This is the 8F from the, uh, the, he the what is it, I forget the, the part number, but it's the heavy freight set, the late uh, three rail heavy freight set. <sighs> well, I think that's more or less all I'm going to do for now. I'll turn him down to zero again. Put the controller down a moment, at least because it's plastic, you know, it's not going to cause any problems if you put it down there. Um, and we didn't change any other points, so I should be able to put him back into that station where he was, just by changing that, that, that point there and running him forwards. Yep, should be able to. See, and now he's start, see, now he's moving at 45%, whereas I could barely get him to move at 100% to start with. Very, it's a bit weird the way it goes. You, want, you know, they need a heck of a lot less power once they're warmed up. But what can you do? Anyway, I'm certainly glad to have this controller. It, uh, it makes my life uh, trying to do running video a lot easier. So we'll see how it goes in the future.